SpaceX's Starship Flight Test 9 suffered a loss of control of attitude last night, and with it, a potential loss of attitude in the space community, a slow eroding of the trust in this vehicle and what it might be able to do for the future. But there's still a lot of hope, myself included, that this vehicle can change the space industry and the space economy as we know it. I've been following SpaceX for about 15 years, ever since they started launching Falcon 9 out of Cape Canaveral in 2010. I remember those early failures and those uncertainties. I have a very vivid memory of their first successful booster landing in December 2015. And Starship last night was the second time since Falcon 9 in 2016 to have flown a booster that flew to space, landed back, and flew back. Now, if you don't count some of the reusable parts of Space Shuttle, like that, that's putting that aside. A booster from Flight Test 7 landed, was caught by the chopsticks, and reflown last night. So that in itself is history right there. The, only the second time, only one company, only one entity has ever accomplished such a feat. And we, I think at this point, all agree that this is the future. I, again, remember a time back in those early days when reflying boosters was seen as controversial. Is the economics going to work out? Does it make sense to refurbish and refly? And I think resoundingly the answer is yes. So we see other companies, even skeptical ones like Ariane Group, follow suit. It was such a relief to see the end of that tube all lit up with Raptor engines, all of the engines. They were lit, they were firing, that was a good success as well because in past flight tests it has not been so. Starship last night got all the way to Seco, that is second engine cut off. It successfully got ship to orbit or I should say an orbital trajectory. Unfortunately, ship did not make it. <laughs> this seems to be a repeat of history every time they do this. It blew up. This time it did not blow up over the Caribbean islands. This time it made it all the way to the Indian island somewhere about 40, 45 minutes into the flight and exploded. Backing up, we did have the booster explode kind of on purpose because they weren't intending to catch it. They wanted to test it to its limits. I don't know if it exploded exactly in the time or way that they anticipated, but they did not intend for that booster to make it back down on those chopsticks. With ship, it was a bit more disappointing. Immediately, you could see that there was some kind of spin going on that wasn't supposed to occur. They couldn't really get control within ship when they had the, the images, which by the way, the images were amazing. Within ship, you could see little particles. And I, weren't sh I wasn't sure if that was like pieces of something or just pieces of frozen water, you know, ice. Uh, I probably ice, but I don't know for certain. But watching the trajectory of that debris, you could see that there was net gravity going on in ways that probably SpaceX didn't want. To me, that was a sign that something was definitely wrong with the trajectory or the way that the spacecraft was moving. And then within ship, there was eight dummy satellites, eight, eight simulated Starlink satellites, the larger version that Starship will eventually launch. They anticipated, they had planned to deploy those, but they couldn't fully open the payload bay doors. That's the PEZ dispenser. It, it was not fully actuated, so they could not end up deploying. It was funny because as I was watching them attempt this procedure, I was thinking they have so much production for Starlink. Why didn't they just send up eight Starlinks, like real ones, because you know they, they make so many. <laughs> and then just five minutes later, I'm like, oh, well, good thing they didn't because that would have been a waste. And I think we were all anticipating that ship would get further along than it did in terms of re-entry. If you're gonna put people on it, you need to safely be able to land it. And we have not seen that yet. I came away with it, you know, glad that they got the data, but also disappointed with the progress. And they're working really hard. I don't wanna discount how much that team, those teams are working on this vehicle to make it happen. But I think we all agree that progress has been slower than we wanted. We can take Elon time into account. We know that whatever date he said that he wanted Starlink to be operational, I, think, I don't know, it was, it was years ago, <laughs> that it was never gonna happen years ago. It was not gonna happen as quickly as Elon Musk wanted. However, even I, as an analyst, thought it would happen a little bit quicker. I thought there would be a lot more tests done by now. I thought that there'd be more progress with each test. And so looking at it, I'm definitely seeing that there's frustration within the space community, probably within NASA, their, their main customer. Artemis depends on Starship. A large part of Artemis depends on Starship because Artemis three, which is that human landing on the surface of the moon since 1972, that depends on Starship. And at this point, Artemis three is not on track at all. As much as I personally like to criticize SLS and Orion for being slow to develop and you know huge in budget, in it, at least it's operational, 
you know, it, it's not the thing that's slowing down Artemis III. It's not the thing that's slowing down or threatening the return of humans to the moon. Uh, we've got issues with spacesuits. That's a whole other topic. We've got a few other issues to work with with Artemis III, but the main thing is the lander. And unfortunately, as much as there are champions within NASA and champions within the U.S. government for SpaceX and for Starship, I think there will be grumblings, especially among Congress, as Congress is now trying to decide what to do about NASA's budget after the Trump administration submitted such a weird, awful budget for NASA. I have a video on that if you want to check that out, we'll link it above. Um, Congress is going to be wondering what is the likelihood of success for Starship? How delayed is Artemis 3 going to be? Because Artemis 3 should have already happened if you go by what Mike Pence said back when it was first announced. Prior to Mike Pence talking about 2026, it was actually 2028 with EM3, but I digress. It's not even going to happen. Like, Artemis 3 is not even going to happen in 2028 at this point. At this point, I don't see how it can happen before 2029 at the earliest, simply because Starship is so slow. Now we did have a statement from Elon Musk saying that the next three Starship tests should be a more rapid cadence. He's, he's saying three to four weeks. I would like to see that. That's Elon time. But even you know, any rapid pace here, that you know, even if it's just every two months, let's get it going, let's get progress made. It's not just the cadence of testing, it's also actually getting the improvements to stick. And that's really hard. I, I fully admit that. So I'm here, I'm here like watching from the outside. I'm not the one building it. So I'm not throwing shade on the ones who are actually doing this work. I know that they are working as hard as they can, but I'm also worried for the program that could be canceled or it could be shifted around. In my last video about Blue Origin's Blue Moon, which I will link above, I talked about how if Starship actually is delayed significantly and Blue Moon somehow miraculously with Blue Origin being so slow, but Blue Moon could actually become the first successful lander and be ready before Starship and could swap places with Starship. I mean, that is not the plan right now. And I don't think that's actually going to become the plan, but it's a possibility. There is no other alternative. There is no other human lander. We've got the clips providers that are building uncrewed landers and having mixed success there as well. But the only two human landers that the United States has are Starship HLS and Blue Origin. And if you remember back with the controversy when HLS was first decided upon, they wanted to choose two providers. They said they only had the budget for one. They chose Starship. And then there was a lot of uh, grumbling and some lawsuits and protests. And eventually Blue Origin was chosen as the second provider. And that's it. That's all we have. That's all NASA has the budget for. Now back during the Constellation program, there was a lander called Altair, which did not get very far at all. It was projected to cost a gazillion dollars that go way, way over budget. And if you listen to Mike Griffin, he comes out every so often, actually fairly recently, couple months ago, talked about how the United States should build its own lander. NASA should build its own internal lander at a gazillion dollars and probably not any quicker, probably a lot slower than the development of Starship and Blue Moon. So um, I actually have a whole video on why Mike Griffin is crazy on this. Um, so you can watch that. Uh, but like he does have a point in that the fate of NASA's return to landing humans on the moon is in the hands of these two companies. And right now, neither two companies seem to be going at the pace with the success that NASA needs, especially as it's trying to champion this expensive program. Of course, it's not new that NASA relies on contractors. The original Apollo Lem was built by Grumman, which is Northrop Grumman now. And so it's not new, it's just the control, the aspect of control. NASA does not have control over Starship. And NASA is relying on Starship, not just for Artemis, but for other missions as well. Starship has other customers. For example, the new lunar rovers. There's Astrolab, Venturi Astrolab, that is building Flex specifically designed, like the actual dimensions are designed to fit into Starship. Also, Lunar Outpost Eagle rover is going to fly or proposed to fly on Starship, as is the uh, collaboration between NASA, JAXA, and Toyota, which is building the Lunar Cruiser. Commercial space stations are also relying on Starship. We've got Starlab, which is the Voyager, um, Starlab, Airbus, Mitsubishi, there's a few partners. So is VAST. VAST Haven 1 is going to launch on a Falcon 9, but future versions of VAST space station that they're planning are meant to launch on Starship. They have a few other customers. I'm not gonna name all of them, but um, Superbird 9 for Sky Perfect JSAT, uh, Luxembourg Space Agency and Offworld have a payload, and don't know the status of it, but in you know, announced back in the day, Polaris 3, Jared Isaacman's mission, 
was supposed to launch the, the very first human mission on Starship. I think he might have canceled that because he wanted to divest interest in SpaceX to become NASA administrator, which the vote's coming up next week, I think. But there have been other proposed missions using Starship. Dennis Tito and his wife um, have proposed flying on Starship a circumlunar mission. Dear Moon Project is canceled, but it was going to use Starship to fly around the moons. And so Starship is something that the entire space community has been waiting for, has been planning for. There are whole companies that are planning their payloads around Starship. And the reason they've done so is because Falcon 9 is the workhorse of the world. It is the most successful rocket that has ever existed. And therefore, they are projecting that success onto Starship, but we have not seen that success yet. Going back to Artemis, there is a lot of components that will probably want to launch on Starship. Lunar Gateway is a mixed bag right now. Currently, it's contracted to launch with a Falcon 9 Heavy. It might be canceled, but if it's not canceled or if it's transitioned to a different mission, I don't know how to phrase that. If Gateway becomes something else and it still exists, then I can imagine that they'd want to use Starship to launch larger payloads. Uh, other components of the Artemis program with larger facilities, larger infrastructure, larger hardware would want to use Starship. And in particular, I want to talk about a lunar base. Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, did an interview with Elon Musk yesterday before the flight. And I don't think it's on his YouTube channel. I think he posted it only on X, so I'll link it below. By the way, if you're not subscribed to the channel, I highly recommend it. He's one of the only space YouTubers that I personally watch. Like, I think we should adapt Artemis to say, like, let's have a base on the moon, not just like, go do a, a remake of his great movie from 1969. Right. Which will never be, the remake's never gonna be as good. Right. So uh, the, the goals of Artemis, I think, are feeble. They're just objectively feeble. So a lot of people were criticizing Elon Musk for making that statement, saying that he's uninformed, saying that Artemis is planning for a lunar base, has always planned for a lunar base, but actually I think he's right. I think other people are missing his point in that so far, Artemis has not been about sustainable presence on the surface of the moon, even though that's what it claims to be. It claims to want to support a lunar base or bases. They haven't made a decision, but we have not really seen that take action. We haven't seen that come to fruition. There's no budget for that. There's token money that NASA has been awarding and doing studies and trying to develop the technology for infrastructure on the surface of the moon and facilities and what that would look like. And not just NASA, but DARPA also and other organizations have contributed to this, but there's no actual solid plan. The Chinese have a plan. The Chinese are going to have a lunar base. NASA is giving lip service and token money to a lunar base, and that is not a sustainable lunar effort. Our priorities follow the money. And if the US government is not going to give money to a lunar base, then that is not our priority. I'm going off topic of this video, but it really frustrates me. And you might notice that with my other videos that NASA really has such short-sighted goals while claiming to be futuristic and looking long-term because it has never been given the money to actually act on longer-term goals. Artemis is supposedly a moon to Mars program. The Mars part might as well be fiction. It really might. There are studies that are done but no real solid plans, nothing scheduled, nothing that has real funding behind it for a solid lunar base where we can test how to live and work on the surface of the moon and then go on to Mars and actually do real human missions to Mars. With Elon Musk's interest in apparently a lunar base in addition to going to Mars, that's news to me by the way, I didn't know that he had an interest in a lunar base, uh, maybe we can have the success of SpaceX in general with Starlink being a huge part of that success and of course Falcon 9 bringing in enough budget for them to develop in-house what the, what the US government just can't provide at this time. Which is why my long-term outlook for Starship is positive because with this difficulty aside, they will get through it. They might not get through it in the timeline that we'd like to see, but they will make Starship happen because as long as SpaceX exists, and as long as Elon Musk is alive, their mission is to get humans to Mars, and that requires Starship. I am truly looking forward to seeing Flight Test 10. There was supposed to be an Elon Musk update yesterday that never happened. I don't know if it's gonna be rescheduled, but I will keep you apprised.